Okay gang, now that we've made it through our first chapter of hypothesis testing, I, I wanted to give you a summary at the end of these chapters that will lay out specifically the 13 steps involved for each hypothesis test that we picked up in that chapter. So for chapter nine, we picked up the one sample proportion hypothesis test, um, the proportion Z hypothesis test, and we also picked up the one sample mean T hypothesis test. So I wanna show you what those 13 steps look like uh, to help you, to help guide you with your write-up. So step one, right, always define that parameter, and in proportion land, you're gonna have P equaling the true proportion of something, all right? Your null and your alternate are here. You'll have P equal to a number. Your alternate will still have the P and the same number, but it'll have a different symbol, right? In step four, you're gonna give me your alpha. If your alpha isn't given, default to 5%. You have to check your assumptions, and these are always the assumptions we're gonna use in proportion land, at least for one samples, or one sample hypothesis test. Remember that assumption two is the deal breaker, right? If we don't meet this one, we're not on the normal, uh, the sampling distribution, that, or a, a sampling distribution that's got the normal bell curve, and we can't proceed with the problem. All right, when it comes to the later steps, let's get, or I should say the middle steps, Let's start in on chapter, or excuse me, step six. All right, so you're gonna tell me the name of the distribution. You can either say Z's, the Z distribution, or you can call it the standard normal distribution. Those are the same thing, All right? Give me the name, so again, number of samples, what land you're in, what letter you're using. There are no degrees of freedom in proportion land. It's the only land where there's no degrees of freedom. All right, here will be the formula for your test statistic in step nine. This will always be the formula. In step 10, you'll be putting in your numbers for your particular problem, right? And keep in mind, steps 10, 11, and 12, you can get from your calculator, right? So we have technology that can help us with steps 10, 11, and 12, in most cases. I mean, you just saw a few multiple choice quest questions where I forced you not to be able to use one prop Z test. But in step 11, get me that p-value, and you're gonna use normal CDF to do it. It should always be a number between zero and one as it's a probability, right? Sketch a picture of the situation, either left-tailed, right-tailed, or two-tailed, all right? And then state your conclusion. You got you only two sentences, right? You're either gonna reject or fail to reject the null. And then you either have sufficient evidence or you do not have sufficient evidence for the alternate. Make sure you use context, okay? All right, so let's see what we gotta do when we're in mean land. All right, so let's take a look at our 13 steps when we're in mean land, when we're doing a mean T test. And I've said a few times, you can do a mean Z test. Some statisticians do, as long as their sample size is 30 or higher. I just don't adhere to that philosophy. So we're always gonna use the T test. All right, so this time you're not defining P's, you're gonna give me mu's for means, and you're gonna have true average or true mean of something rather than true proportion. You're still gonna have your null and your alternate with your parameters, so whatever you define in step one, I should see in steps two and three. And you're gonna have the same number in your hoe and your hop, but your symbol will change. You'll always have the equals two up here, and either a left-tailed, right-tailed, or two-tailed test. You'll give me your alpha, right? You're gonna check your assumptions. And our assumptions are different in mean land than proportion land, but we still have that deal breaker, right? This is guaranteeing that our sampling distribution has the approximately normal shape. If we don't meet this assumption, you can't continue on with the problem because you don't, you're not allowed to use TCDF. Uh, when we get to steps six, seven, eight, and nine, the last of our setups, right? In terms of the, uh, the distribution you're on, you're on the T distribution. Sometimes we put a little subscript with the number of degrees of freedom. You don't have to, but if you see that, if you see a little subscript, that's what it's referring to. Here's your name, right? Number of samples, what land you're in, what letter you're using. Your degrees of freedom formula here is n minus one. There's our test statistic, at least the formula for it, value minus mean over standard deviation, or statistic minus parameter over standard error. All right, in steps 10, 11, and 12, there's gonna be some computations, and, a, and you owe me a graph. All right, but in step 10, we're gonna take our test statistic and plug in our numbers for our particular problem. You can get step 10 directly from the t-test calculator output screen. You can also get step 11 from your calculator's output screen. And if, if I give you, if I don't give you enough information to use that t-test function on your calculator, you can always use tcdf to find a p-value. And again, your p-value should always be a number between zero and one. 
you will sketch a picture of the situation, right? Left tailed, right tailed, two tailed. Keeping in mind now your X axis will have the letter T on it, right? Where in proportion land it would have had the letter Z. All right, and then you're gonna state your conclusion in two sentences. Again, you're either gonna reject or fail to reject the null. And then based on what you do here, you will either have evidence for the alternate or you will not have evidence for the alternate, okay? All right, so with that, let's get uh, some ground rules under our belt, just in terms of what the 13 steps are gonna look like, not only in this chapter, but as we progress through the chapters. Okay, I just wanna provide some, uh, like a general overview of what's gonna be happening with these 13 steps as we progress through the chapters, because we're gonna get hypothesis tests in chapters nine, 10, 11, and 13. So this hypothesis test, Thing. It's a major idea in stats, so it's not going away. It's with us for the rest of the semester. So in step one, you're always going to define your parameter, okay? And you're either going to be in mean land or proportion land for this chapter. So that means we'll either have a mu or a p. Those are going to be your two options here. We're going to have the same basic idea in chapter 10, but we will change in chapters 11 and 12, excuse me, 11 and 13. You're always going to state your null and your alternate, all right? And think of steps two and three as kind of a package deal. All right, and you're always gonna use parameters in your alternate, your null and your alternate. You will never use statistics, all right? Never write statistics in your null and alternate, but whatever parameter you defined in step one, whether it was a mu or a p, I should see those popping up in steps two, or th two and three, all right? There should always be colons directly after the symbols ho and ha. The null should always have the equal sign, and the symbol from the alternate depends on the wording of the problem. If you aren't sure, select the not equals to alternate. When you select a not equals to alternate, your p-value would be twice as large as a one-sided test. But if your p-value is larger, all that means is that you're less likely to reject the null, less likely to reject the status quo and change your mind. It's just playing it safe, all right? Which there's no shame in that, okay? All right, let me move this up so we can look at some of our other assumptions, or it means other steps in our write-up. All right, so step four, you're always gonna give me the significance level, the alpha level. All right, if, if I'm not stating, or if it's not directly stated, default to 5%, that's the industry standard. Check all of your assumptions. The normality assumption is always the deal breaker. If that assumption is met, is not met, excuse me, you should stop the problem. This is the assumption that lets you know um, which distribution you're on and what calculator command you can use in step 11. All right, for step six, we're going to state the distribution of the test. And in these chapters, you have two options. And by these chapters, I mean in chapters 9 and 10, you'll either be on the Z distribution or the T distribution. Okay? So we're either going to be on the sampling distribution for proportions, i.e. the standard normal curve, or we're going to be on the T distribution, which will have a degree of freedom associated with it. As we progress through the next two chapters, or the last two chapters, 11 and 13, we're going to pick up something called a chi-squared distribution and an F distribution. So a couple of new graphs, where these first two look like the bell curve, all right? These last two will be unimodal but very skewed right. So if you can see my hand as I'm air drawing it, like it'll have a high peak and then a large right tail. So that's typically what these look like. Eventually, these will start to look more and more like the bell curve, depending on degrees of freedom, but we're, we're going to get to that. We're not there yet. Okay, so that's, that's what we're looking at in step six. State the distribution of the test. All right, for step seven, uh, you're going to follow this format in chapters nine and ten. We're going to deviate from it in chapters 11 and 12, but for right now, you're going to give me number of samples, which land you're in, which letter you're using, and the word hypothesis test. So for chapter nine, it was either one sample proportion Z hypothesis test or it was one sample mean T hypothesis test. When we move into chapter 10, you're either gonna give me two sample proportion Z hypothesis test, two sample mean T hypothesis test, or paired mean T hypothesis test. And we'll talk about when you use two samples versus pairings when we get to chapter 10. The letter you choose here is gonna be the same as the letter you choose in step six. So for chapters nine and 10, it'll either be Z and T. For chapter 11, it'll be a chi-squared. And for chapter 13, it'll be an F, okay? And so, like I said, as we progress through chapters 11 and 13, we're gonna pick up other options, all right? So then let me move this up so we can look at steps eight, nine, and 10 collectively. 
All right, let me move that up a little bit more. All right, here we go. So in step eight, you're gonna state the degrees of freedom. All right, you're never gonna have degrees of freedom in proportion land, but every other land will have a formula for degrees of freedom. And we'll use the formulas um, as, as needed. They're all unique to their distributions. So T has the formula N minus one. It also has a different formula when we get to chapter 10. Chi squareds have a different formula. F's have a different formula. So they all have their own formulas. All right, display the test statistic to be used without any computation. So this will be a formula that involves the letter you chose in, steps, in step six. So we're either gonna be defining a Z, a T, a chi-squared, or an F. And again, each formula is unique to the distribution, okay? We're gonna compute the test statistic with this, our specific numbers being used. So this will be the same formula as step nine, but you're gonna use the numbers for your specific problem, all right? And your answer will be one number, and we're gonna call that the test statistic, okay? So there's steps eight, nine, and 10. So step 11 is calculating the p-value, and I think this is something we struggle with or students struggle with every semester. Like, what is the p-value? How do I calculate it? What does it actually mean? So I'm gonna talk about what it means, uh, a common misinterpretation, how to actually calculate it, and then I will show you again what a p-value means. We'll do it with a couple of actual examples um, so you can get the feels for what a p-value represents. All right, so p-values are probabilities, which means in step 11, you owe me a number between zero and one, and they are always between zero and one. Every probability we've ever done in here was a number between zero and one, starting with chapter three, all the way through chapter 13. So here we go, what is the p-value? The p-value is a probability that if the null was true, we would see sample data we saw in our test, or maybe even more extreme, just by chance alone. So the p-value is the probability that if the null is true, which is something we're assuming right out the gate, you have to assume something when you're running a hypothesis test, and we're assuming the null is true. So the p-value is the probability that given that the null is true, what's the probability that we would see the sample data we saw just by chance? Okay, because you can imagine if you run an experiment, something has to happen, right? Something has to happen in my sample. I, some outcome has to happen. I'm running an experiment. So we want to know the likelihood that what you saw happen in your experiment would actually happen, right? So I'll say it again. We wanna know the likelihood or the probability that what you saw happen in your experiment would actually happen just by chance, all right? Because again, something has to happen. So how likely is this thing that I'm seeing? How likely is that to happen? And we could swap out this phrase happening by chance alone. Some folks use this phrase, happens by um, random variation, random chance, sampling error, that kind of thing. So we're saying, again, if you run an experiment, something has to happen, all right? You're gonna witness something. So this p-value is saying, well, if the null was true, what's the likelihood that what I saw happen might actually happen, right? Is this rare? Is it common? We need a probability around it. So p-values are frequently misinterpreted. A common mistake is the notion that they represent the likelihood or the probability of rejecting a null that is true. All right, so some people think p-values represent the probability that I would reject the null even if it was true, and, and that's, that's not the case, right? That's a type one error, All right, and we already have a symbol for that. We have an alpha for that. So the idea that p-values are the probability of making a mistake is wrong. All right, we have alpha and beta to represent those probabilities. All right, the p-value is the probability that if the null were true, what we saw happening in our experiment would actually happen. Like how likely is that outcome, okay? Not how likely is it that I messed up, how likely that I was right, just what's the probability that if the null is true, what I saw happen would actually happen, okay? To calculate a p-value, if we wanna go more now to the mechanic side, not so much the theoretical side of what is it, but how do I calculate it? Well, to calculate a p-value, you need some sort of CDF function in your calculator. Every p-value calculation will require a capital P with some parentheses. And in these parentheses, you should write a letter, a symbol, and a number, all right? So our calculator functions, we've seen two of them. We've seen normal CDF and TCDF. When we get to chapter 11, we'll pick up chi-squared CDF. When we get to chapter 13, we'll pick up FCDF. All right, so in terms of letters, symbols, numbers, as we progress through the rest of the semester, your letters will either be T, excuse me, Z, T, chi-squared, or F, right? And for chapters 
9 and 10, you'll either have Z or T. All right, you'll either have a greater than or less than symbol. And the number, this number that you're, you're required to put in is the number you calculated in step 10. All right, so letter, symbol, number. When you get to step 12, you're gonna sketch a picture of the situation. So you're gonna draw a picture of your distribution and you have four options. You're either gonna give me the standard normal distribution, right, the Z curve. You're gonna give me the T distribution. Or in chapter 11, you'll give me the chi-squared distribution. Chapter 13, the F distribution. All right, you're gonna make sure to label your x-axis with the correct letter. Whatever letter you defined in step six, that's the letter you should label your axis with. The number that you calculated in step 10 should show up along your x-axis somewhere. The proportion of area shaded in your picture should match the p-value you found in step 11. So I provided an example of each distribution and I have a couple of one-sided tests. Actually, I have three one-sided tests and a two-sided test. So let's take a look at some of our options here. So as I move through this, right, here is my Z distribution. So you can see I have my bell curve, right? I've labeled my X axis with the letter Z, zeros under the peak. There's my test statistic that I would have calculated in step 10. And here's the area I would have shaded, okay? Here, this is the T distribution, right? So you see I've got my X axis, I've labeled it with the T, zeros under the peak. This is a two-sided tail, a two-tailed test. So you see that I've got 2.086 here, negative 2.086 here, and I have the, the correct sh um, area shaded under that curve, okay? This is your basic chi-squared and F distributions. Now you can see they're slightly skewed right, right? They're not completely roughly, well, they're roughly symmetric, but they're more skewed right than, than roughly symmetric. You can see the right tail is longer here, but I labeled this with chi-squared. A lot of people like to say X squared, it's chi, it's the Greek letter chi. Here's our F distribution. Um, when we get there, and I know we're not there yet, but chi-squared and F tests only have right tails to them. So they will always shade from your test statistic to the right. But there I am labeling my test statistic and shading the area to the right. All right, and last but not least, you'll have step 13. All right, you'll owe me your conclusion. So you're gonna state your conclusion in two sentences. You need to tell me if you're gonna reject or fail to reject H naught. And you will straight up say, that your p-value is less than alpha or your p-value is greater than alpha and that's why you're making your decision. All right? And then based on that decision, you will either have sufficient evidence for the alternate or not. All right, so you will state whether or not you have it and then make sure you include your context, okay? So don't just say we have sufficient evidence for the alternate, tell me what the alternate is. All right, so that's your basic rundown of the 13 steps. I've kind of given you a preview of where we're going in chapters 11 and 13 and also where we're going or where we've been in chapter nine and where we're immediately going in chapter 10. All right, so we're gonna work with, work on what is a p-value in just a moment and then we're gonna wrap up this chapter. All right, see you guys, bye.